Theo Epstein. He joins us now on the Score Hotline, brought to you by Circa Resort and Casino in Las Vegas, the home of the world's largest sports book. Theo, good morning. How are you? Morning, guys. Long time no talk. Good to hear your voices. Oh, it's morning, great Theo. to hear your voice. Yeah. And, and can we just say thank you again, as long as we have you on the phone? <laughs> <laughs> we miss you, Theo. <laughs> Thanks. Miss, you. miss Chicago, too. Um, we moved about uh, eight months ago, and I've, I've been lucky enough to be back a couple times, but um, had a great 10 years there and, and really miss it every day. Well, that's wonderful, and you're well missed uh, yourself and well received always here in town. And um, you know, uh, you're getting a lot of the credit for um, the influence that you've shown over these rule changes, and we're kind of excited about it, I think, because you know, I got my my son's 18, and I, I've got a couple of daughters. They, you, you, they kids are just not following baseball in the way that we did when we were younger, and I think part of that is because the games are taking three and a half hours for God's sake or whatever, 320. And and I said to David, the best thing about this is this will speed up the game. And and I, you know, it's we live in a world of these weird kind of uh, video games and this lack of attention. Yep. To, and, and I think this will help keep the fans loving the game of baseball. Yeah, well, first of all, I, I shouldn't be getting the credit at all. It's literally an industry-wide effort, you know, led by the commissioner and the owners and the joint competition committee and then the players who really dug in and, and helped improve um, a lot of these rules. But I, I agree with your premise. I mean, it's, it's a couple things. It, it is that, um, you know, the sensibility of, of uh, you know, Gen Z and, and does, doesn't necessarily match up with, with the pace of baseball and, and, and some, some, to some degree, the nature of baseball, just with growing up on, on iPhones will shorten your attention span a little bit. And, you know, I know just from watching my own kids, you know, they like to skip to the end, skip right to the action, not necessarily invest, you know, three hours and 10 minutes, which is the average length of a major league game into something for the reward. And then, and then the other aspect of it is beyond that, the game has changed a lot over, over the last 20 years without, any real intention behind it. It's just been, you know, natural evolution, optimizations pushed by um, organizations, front offices, you know, in some cases, people like me, uh, pushed by the players themselves just trying to get better. That has led the game down a path that nobody would have necessarily designed. You know, if we were sitting down 20, 30 years ago to, to plot out, you know, the next few decades of baseball, nobody would have sat there at the drawing board and said, hey, let's let's come up with a game where the league gets closer to 240 than to 265, you know, um, actually closer to 220 than to 265. The league at 243 last year, nobody would have asked for a league where the strikeout rate for, for an average pitcher is higher than Bob Gibson's strikeout rate. No one would have asked for more than four minutes um, between balls put in play. No one would have asked for generational lows and stolen bases, triples and doubles. So it's clear the time is now to, step in and just be intentional about some hopefully subtle rule changes that will really improve the amount of action, the amount of athleticism and the pace of play and credit to the commissioner, the owners and the players for, for leaning in and, and trying to be intentional about it now. So Theo, I remember being there in October, 2011, where you basically took over as the president of the Cubs. And this was what the way things are going to go. This is what you guys are going to write. This is what's going to happen next. And you know mm -hmm. what? You were right. You were right in the narrative played out exactly as you saw it playing out. I'm curious now, there's going to be some pushback. There's going to be some resistance. You're talking about America's national pastime. So when you change the game, people are going to maybe feel like, you know, how dare you? How is this going to go? What will the narrative be like going through it? And what will we say after we're used to it? Yeah, well, I think the... You know, the standard can't be to make everybody happy because that's, that's never, as a famous American once said, you, know, you can't please all the people all the time. So that's not going to happen. But um, look, these rules are, rule changes are designed for the fans. And so um, I think it will, in, in the long run, go really well and make for a better version of baseball, a more entertaining product for the fans, and therefore, you know, greater interest uh, in, in the game and a better industry overall for everybody that, that lifts, lifts everyone, including the players. And I think it'd be better for the players too. Um, you know, we did 
an extensive amount of fan outreach through um, surveys, through focus groups, um, to get to get the fans' input on what they what they liked about baseball and what they didn't like about baseball. And, and while everyone has a different version of what you know the best version of baseball might be, that there was a lot of consensus around likes and dislikes. And the, the likes were. Um, stolen bases, doubles, triples, great defensive plays, anything that involves action, athleticism, multiple players in motion, you know, drama, suspense. And as I said earlier, the, the, a lot of those things are at generational lows with the way the game has evolved to the three true outcomes. And then dislikes were, you know, inaction, dead time uh, between pitches, between at-bats, uh, pitching changes, mound visits, things like that, where there's nothing going on. So, you know, we sat down to test a bunch of rules in the minor leagues, checked in with fans along the way um, to, to, to make sure that the, you know, the, the impact of the rules resulted in a game that was more enjoyable for fans. So I'd say, you know, when you ask, how is this going to go? I think there is going to be um, an adjustment period. You know, we saw that in the minor leagues. It was about a three to four week adjustment period um and, and we and we actually polled minor league players too it was eight thousand minor league games that, that we wow. experimented with for these rules and we polled the players as well as the fans hey how long did it take to get used to this what did you like what didn't you like and you know the pitch timer is a good example where there were you know multiple violations per game um which you know results in an automatic ball or an automatic strike depending on 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 who whether it's the pitcher or the hitter, uh, who's the guilty party, for the first few weeks. And it started to slowly go down. And after three, four weeks, there was, between both teams combined, less than half a violation per game on average, which means, you know, if you're following your favorite team, um, there's an automatic ball or automatic strike levied against your team on average just once after once every four games um, after the adjustment period. So it's it's not – you know, once the adjustment period passes, it's not something that should interrupt the flow of the game. In fact, you know, another way to judge the success of these rules is if they're even noticed at all. And my hope is that after the adjustment period, which is spring training and then probably into April, you don't you – know, the same way when, when you're watching, you know, an NBA game, you don't notice the shot clock all the time. All you notice is a great rhythm and flow to each – possession and the ball going up and down the court hopefully you won't notice the pitch timer all all you'll notice is hey this is a really well-paced game it's like mark burley's pitching for both teams that that, <laughs> that would be just a success i love it uh what is your fate is that it is that your favorite new rule then the pitch clock or do you have one that you just like the look of it is there any one that really appeals to you as you were putting this all together Part of I like, yeah, I like the pitch timer because I think it's going to have the greatest impact. And, you know, it, the, the, the pace of play has slowed um, a little bit each year for the last 20 plus years to the point where, you know, you never even notice it changing so much. But that, but then if you, you, you know, you tune into, you know, a, a game from the 70s or 80s, you know, late at night on the MLB network or ESPN Classic or something, which I don't even think exists anymore. But um, <laughs> you tune into a game, you look up and you see, I remember a few years ago, um, one of the games in the uh, 1975 World Series was on. And you notice it right away. It's like, wow, this is such a better version of baseball. Louis Tiant is getting the ball, gets his sign and fires. It's like a pitch every 10 seconds. And you can't take your eyes off it. And then you sit there and you realize, wow, the game, not only does the game last, you know, 30, 40 minutes um, shorter without all the dead time, but it just, you, you know, it, there's just the action just jumps out at you and sort of the organic flow of the game. Every time you take a breath, there's a pitch delivery, which is kind of the way it's supposed to be. It keeps you locked in and creates a better version of baseball. So, we're so used to now, you know, the pitcher taking a stroll around the mound, the hitter stepping out, adjusting his batting gloves and everything else <laughs> between pitches. That I think is just going to be a breath of fresh air, um, resulting in, you know, better pace of play, get everyone home 20, 30 minutes earlier. And then importantly, also a, a, a better version of baseball. And we saw in our, in our experiments in the minor leagues that with the pitch timer, once players adjusted to it again, after those, three, four week adjustment period, pitchers actually threw more strikes with the pitch timer because there's locked in more and, and, and more efficient hitters swung the bat a little bit more often. Uh, fielders 
uh, were locked in and in, in, in the game and therefore made, made better defensive play. So just, just overall a crisper, better version of baseball. So yeah, that's probably the one I'm most excited about. Okay. So amplify this because I saw the data and I'm not quite sure uh, 8,000 games and you claim that the, the pitch clock, there were fewer injuries than more because I think there's a concern Theo, as you know, when you when you condense everything, there's less recovery time between pitches, between innings, and you wonder with all these arms conditioned to take those thirty second breaks and to to have that kind of recovery time. How will it affect injuries? Is that the biggest concern that you've heard? Yeah. So the the data basically showed that it was you know infinitesimally fewer injuries. So about about the same. I think the biggest takeaway was. You know, it didn't spike injuries, which is obviously a concern. That's why we tested these rules as as, as much as we did in the minor leagues, was to make sure um, we avoided any unintended consequences, and we would never um, we would never do anything that that increases um, injury risk. In fact, a lot of these rules, especially the bigger bases, um, are, are designed to try to enhance player safety. But yeah, you're right. So. There is data out there that um, increased time between pitches um, enhances pitcher recovery, and, and, and what 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 that leads to though is more pitches thrown at max effort. And there are studies out there that demonstrate that the the, the single most dangerous thing you can do as a pitcher um, is throw really hard with max effort often, and 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 so. Uh, you know, what happens naturally and, and what we used to see in the game back when pitching was more of an art and less of a display of pure power, which is what you see now, is pitches, pitchers would modulate their effort. You know, that back then it, it was a goal of a starting pitcher not just to miss as many bats as you could for five innings and get out of there, but to, to get really deep in the game. So you'd see pitchers coming out throwing, you know, 89 in the first inning and then in the big spot they'd ramp up to – 93, 94, and, and, and modulate their effort. You would, you'd see an occasional, you know, first pitch sinker down the middle. They could try to get a ground ball and be efficient, or a one-one sinker down the middle, just get pitch to contact a little bit, which you don't see anymore. Pitching has evolved for a lot of different reasons um, into more of a pure power display, where where just about every organization and every pitcher is trying to go out there and, and miss miss a lot of bats. So with with the with the uh, slightly decreased recovery time between pitches, what we expect to happen will be that, you know, pitchers will modulate their effort a little bit more. If you don't have 30 seconds between pitches to make every pitch a Broadway production and, 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 and throw as hard as you can every single pitch, the art of pitching will come back a little bit more and, and you'll see um, a little bit, a little bit more finesse and a little bit more modulated effort into the game rather than, pitchers redlining it all the time and, and pushing themselves to the to the brink of injury. It, it is extraordinary to me that there is so much sudden change, right? Like it, it's not just one rule. There's four major rules at one time. Did you contemplate spreading it out more? and Or is it better to just, uh, here we go, with this, this is the new game? Um, look, I think, I think baseball as an industry can be slow to change. And, and that the game uh, – you know, to, to slow to change with intention, and that the the game has been changing a lot on, on its own over over the last several years, just through these optimizations and through the way organizations are you know positioning players, training players, you know the the, the, the way players are going about playing the game. So I, I think we felt it was overdue, um, and and you know testing these rules in the minor leagues. I don't think we're um, asking anything of players or umpires um, that that they can't handle. These are the best athletes in the world. Um, the, you know, the players have had input into these rules as well um, that they can't handle with an, an adjustment period. I mean, the, the pitch timer really does become second nature um, after, you know, the three to four week adjustment period. The bigger bases, we found that there's essentially, you know, no adjustment period or, or just a matter of a couple of weeks that that should be adjusted to by the end of spring training. And then, you know, the playing without extreme defensive shifts is simply, you know, a return to how the game was played for its first century and 
and how you know the game is still played the majority of the time. You're just you're just eliminating you know the extreme the extreme shifts. So that shouldn't be that much of an adjustment period. I think limiting the amount of um, pickoff throws, which is a necessary element of the pitch timer rule, because right. it closes closes a loophole. That will take some adjusting to, um, and, and we think over spring training in the first few weeks of the season, um, that should be accomplished. So, yeah, we there were some you know some other things contemplated and some things down down the road that, depending on the results of of um, you know these rule changes, are contemplated that that we felt this would be too much. This would be asking too much of the players. This would be asking too much of the umpire. So I feel like these ru- rules were streamlined and simplified enough where. Uh, it's realistic that we can go out and have uh, a really good season altogether. Yeah, we know you know something about roster construction, so I'm curious when you talk about banning the shift, you how will that affect p- perhaps how you put together an infield? We see here with the Cubs in Chicago, with it, we're very familiar with Nico Horner moving to second base. Danzy Swanson signed to play shortstop. Basically, you have two shortstops up the middle because now maybe athleticism is – a higher priority or is it i wonder will that be a byproduct of these rules changes because the way you want to structure your infield with guys who can get have mobility yeah i think you're right i think every organization will look at it a little differently and that's that's the beauty of baseball right i think we want diversity and approach with what teams are trying to do to win how teams interpret you know different different rule changes where you know teams should anticipate um, what style of play will help them win differently. And that's that's good for baseball. It's something we've gotten away from. The game has been homogenized somewhat with everyone sort of trying to rely on power and patience. And you don't see teams like the 85 Cardinals anymore with you know, seven guys who can fly and Jack Clark sitting in the middle. But you know maybe you will now. Maybe teams will take a different approach. But I think that the big obvious headlines, you know, you, you nailed it. Um, there's going to be a premium on – middle infield defense, especially the second baseman. I think that's the the position that um the profile changes the most um because the you know the most the most effective shifts were in the past were against left handed hitters and you could really hide, you know, uh a third baseman playing you know, a, a third base profile um at second base, knowing that when when a lefty was up you could put him in a position where he didn't have to range that much and give the shortstop the, the majority of the hard work. Well, now that second baseman is going to be naked. He's got to cover, you know, along with the first baseman, cover the whole right side of the infield. You can't stick him deep, deep into shallow right field. So uh, range, athleticism, ability to make plays at the extremity of your range. So in other words, diving plays where you, where you leave your feet, uh, glove the ball, and, and pop up quickly and throw, throw the, the, base, the batter runner out that's going to be extremely important. So I don't think teams are going to try to get away with a bat first, um, you know, sort of corner profile at second base anymore. I think you're going to need more athletic second baseman. That's, I think that's good for, good for the game. You know, the, the rule changes like the bigger bases and the pickoff limitations that, that also uh, encourage more stolen base attempts and encourage the running game might impact roster construction as well where you know just generally now you know players who can run players with good base stealing instincts are 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 going to be able to run more often and more successfully you know the last few years we've seen uh the league leader in stolen bases last year had 41 right. stolen bases the year before that was 39 so mm-hmm. you know if if as a result of these changes teams you know skew a little bit more athletic with a little bit more team speed and there's a return to you know, the Jose Reyes and Jacoby Ellsbury stealing 70 plus bags that we saw a decade ago, or, or heaven forbid, you know, Vince Coleman, Ricky Henderson guys stealing 100 plus bags. Like, that, that wouldn't really be bad for baseball based on, based on what fans are telling us. They, they really do like the running game. So, and then the last roster construction piece just with the, with the shifts again is that it, it, it should restore a better in play environment for left handed hitters. You know, with, with, with the extreme shifting, left-handed hitters have had a much more difficult in-play environment um, recently than they had previously, and this should open up you know, some more hits for those left-handed hitters. Theo, thank you. Thanks a ton. This is a lot of fun. I, I, you know, We're really looking forward to the start of the season, obviously, and it, it's going to be cool. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. I think it makes spring training uh, more interesting than it usually is, and we just encourage everybody to, you know, 
bear with us in April. You know, we know we know there's going to be an adjustment period that that leaks into the season and patience with with the players and the umpires and with the rules and um, you know ultimately I think the game. I said this when we announced the rules. You know the the game is about the players and it's for the fans. And these rules, um, once the adjustment period happens, should put the players even more in the forefront of the action, you know, more, more frequently, not having to wait four minutes to put a ball in play, you know, put the players right in the spotlight, and ultimately it'll be a better, better version of baseball on, on the field for, for the fans. So we appreciate everyone's support and cooperation. Let's look forward to, uh, you know, to an even better version of the game out there for us all to enjoy. You, know, you did a great job explaining it, but admit it, you you miss running a team a little bit, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's weird. This this time of year, I wake up and I, I have that feeling like I'm forgetting something. I really, you know, like my body thinks I'm supposed to be in spring training right now, meeting with players, figuring stuff out. So yeah, this this time of year, you know, the draft, the trade deadline, postseason, uh, really do miss it, but. I'm not even 50 yet, so I got, I got some years ahead of me to get back in. I think this is uh, – I'm in the right role right now. I really appreciate the commissioner um, giving me the seat at the table for this important issue. Great stuff. Thanks, Theo. Thanks, Theo. All right, guys. See Good ya. talking to you. Take care. That's Bye. Theo Epstein. Wow. Huh? Not Good stuff. 50. Not even 50. He's still the smartest guy in the 49 room. years old. His third act is going very well. Can't wait to see what's next. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, it'll it'll – There'll be winning involved. Let's say that, right? You heard it from them right there. I, I'm looking forward to this now a lot more than I was before.